In lecture two, we looked at steel bridge economy and simple span steel bridges up to 140 feet. Here in lecture three, we're going to extend that. We're going to look at multi-span bridges that include longer spans, multiple spans, and a piece of design software for multi-span bridges. So designing steel girder bridges must consider material costs, fabrication costs, and effective layout practice to arrive at an economical design. This lecture will start with a discussion on sound span, girder depth, and girder spacing layout practice for continuous span steel bridges as a starting point for design. With this good initial starting point, the presentation will demonstrate steel bridge design software from the National Steel Bridge Alliance called Simon that can efficiently check the initial design or iterate alternatives for design optimization. LRFD Simon, LRFD stands for Load and Resistance Factor Design. Simon is a software program that is part of a larger package available through the NSBA, termed the NSBA Steel Bridge Suite. In addition to LRFD Simon, the Steel Bridge Suite also includes the NSBA software package called Splice. The NSBA Steel Bridge Suite is a collection of software solutions and references for efficient steel bridge analysis and preliminary design that is available free of charge and includes a perpetual software license. The intent of the suite is to assist the design community to more rapidly evaluate design alternatives and make more educated decisions that will result in more economical steel designs and an overall better end product for the owner or the client. Also included in the suite are links to the 19 volumes and six design examples that currently make up the NSBA Steel Bridge Design Handbook, as well as links to the eight available AASHTO NSBA Steel Bridge co Collaboration Standards. An official registration website was created to help manage downloads of the suite and notify existing users of any important updates and clarifications. The URL to the registration site is shown at the bottom of this slide. Once you have registered, you will receive an email containing a link to download the installation package. You are free to install the suite as many times as you wish across your organization. Since its release, over 1,100 individuals, including consultants, DOTs, and educators, have registered to download the Bridge Suite. Now let's take a brief introductory tour or, or an overview of the LRFD Simon product and its user interface. In addition to the LRFD Simon software, also included in the download is a range of examples that can be altered, if desired, to more closely approximate the specific design the engineer is investigating. All Simon input files are standard ASCII text files that can be viewed and edited with a text editor like, like Microsoft Notepad. There are a total of 34 examples delivered inst and installed with Simon, encompassing one, two, three, and four span configurations. Both eye girder and box girder examples are included. There are three main regions within the Simer user interface. The menu toolbar at the top, the task navigation pane at the left, and the input output window pane at the right. The menu toolbar, the menu toolbar includes three options, file, analyze, and help, along with an icon toolbar underneath these options. The help menu is used to display the LRFD Simon user's guide, which can help you to get started with the software. Using the file menu uh, toolbar item, a list of the most recently used or edited input files is displayed for quicker access to the files you work with the most. The typical workflow is to begin at the top left of the task navigation pane at the left and work your way towards the bottom, inputting appropriate values along the way 
until you are ready to run the analysis and view the results. The analysis may be executed using either the icon toolbar or the menu below, or the menu toolbar. Once the analysis is completed, the results are then displayed in the right window pane. <clears throat> Specific focus was given to how the results would be formatted and displayed so that the report would be the most helpful and valuable to the design engineer. One nice feature of Simon is that in addition to material quantities, Simon can also approximate the fabricated cost of the girders. Input screens are provided to allow the user to assign material unit cost factors for different yield strengths, as well as cost factors or multipliers for different fabricated girder components, as shown here. Note that the values shown here are only for demonstration and do not represent real relative present day cost for fabrication. The factors are simply proportional with the intent being to attempt to simulate the relative fabrication costs of different components in order to evaluate and compare the approximate costs of different girder design options. For example, using these factors, the designer can quickly evaluate the relative cost effects of utilizing a thicker web in lieu of providing additional transfer stiffeners. Simon output is formatted in XML. XML is a common human readable file format that has the agility to be viewed not only within the Simon user interface, but also with any application that supports XML. For example, Microsoft Excel. Simon also delivers an XML style sheet, which is used to transform the XML file into a more readable format that includes a table of contents, headings, and tabulated values. Now let's describe what LRFD Simon is and some of the basic product capabilities. Simon is a powerful line girder analysis and design program that allows the user to quickly produce complete steel superstructure designs in accordance with the AASHTO LRFD specifications. A line girder analysis is when we estimate the moments, the shears, and the end reactions on a single girder from the total non-composite, composite, and vehicle live loads on the bridge. And we design the girder based on those distributed loads on that girder. The program is intended for the preliminary design of steel I-shaped plate girders and multiple single cell box girders. Each girder may be a simple span or it may consist up to 12 continuous spans. The program can handle webs with parabolic or linear haunches. Webs can be transversely stiffened with or without longitudinal stiffeners or unstiffened. Cross sections can either be homogeneous or hybrid. The original strategy used to develop the Simon program was to basically design a bridge the same way a bridge engineer would manually design a bridge, thus making the program more user-friendly to designers. The program is strongly dependent on the input data defining the starting design and control parameters selected by the user. Even though Simon is a powerful design package, it is not difficult to run. However, there is a basic assumption inherent in the effective use of Simon in that the user is familiar with bridge design and can select suitable starting designs along with any necessary design parameters that remain unaltered by the Simon program. To use Simon, the bridge designer inputs a trial girder design, which may only be a rough approximation of the final design and need not satisfy specification requirements. A line girder analysis then performed, the user can choose to have the program automatically proportion the principal girder elements in accordance with the AASHTO LRFD specifications using the input trial design as a starting point. If the current design violates the AASHTO provisions, the design is modified by Simon to correct the violations. Otherwise, the design is made lighter, if possible. Or, optionally, 
the user can have the program evaluate the input trial design for one design cycle and make any required changes manually. Throughout the execution of Simon, the user has the option to display the information generated during each design cycle so that the user can later trace that design process. At the end of a successful final design cycle, the transfer stiffeners and the bearing stiffeners plus the stud shear connectors are designed and a bill of materials is produced. It is important to keep in mind that a successful final design produced by Simon does not necessarily mean the attainment of a, quote, best design. The attainment of a best design is still left to the judgment of the design engineer. Basically, Simon quickly and accurately handles all of the structural engineering calculations required for the superstructure design thereby permitting an engineer to conveniently investigate numerous design alternatives. So let's now review some basic guidelines to help you achieve a more suitable initial trial girder design for that initial input into Simon. In the interest of time, we will focus here on eye girder design only and on straight girder bridges with limited skews. We will look at how to determine initial design for input into Simon by looking at span layout, girder spacing and deck overhangs, web depth and thickness, cross frame spacing, and field section length considerations. First, however, I wanna be sure and point out two valuable reef references that are available as part of the NSBA steel bridge suite. These can help you help provide further guidance on developing more suitable steel eye girder designs. Volume six of the NSBA steel bridge design handbook entitled Stringer Bridges, Making the Right Choice and the Ashto NSBA steel bridge collaboration document G12.1 entitled Guidelines for Design for Constructability both of these documents contain helpful design tips and suggestions based on design experience and successful industry practice, and both are part of the NSBA Steel Bridge Suite. So let's begin with a brief discussion on span layout. Steel has the versatility to be built in most any span arrangement. However, steel is most efficient when it's used in properly proportion span arrangements. A carefully planned span arrangement has a positive impact on the economics of a steel bridge. In general, single multi-span girders are preferred over the use of many simple spans or several continuous span units. Modern design techniques and modern bearings permit the use of much longer multi-span structures than were commonly used in the past. The elimination of as many end spans and associated joints as possible is desirable for both first cost and maintenance considerations by providing savings in the number of bearings, cross frames, and expansion devices. To arrive at an optimal span length for a multi-span bridge, it is prudent to develop a range of steel superstructure and substructure costs for various span lengths. The cost of the deck is ignored in these investigations since its cost is constant with respect to span. The most economical span arrangement is at the minimum point of the total cost curve or the curve representing the sum of the variable superstructure cost and fixed substructure cost per pier over the span range under investigation. Simon can be used to relatively quickly develop several continuous span designs for different number of spans in order to generate the superstructure cost curve. In the example case shown here, the optimum span length is 175 feet, which would be the span length chosen for the interior spans of a multi-span continuous unit. In cases where the pier locations are flexible, end span should be then arranged to provide a so-called balanced span arrangement in which the end span lengths are approximately 75 to 82% of the interior span length. 
Such an arrangement yields approximately equal positive moments in the end span and interior spans, which provides for a single optimum girder depth. If unbalanced spans are required, it may be desirable to taper the depth of the girder so that different depths are employed more efficiently in different spans. Using an average span depth can lead to flanges that are too large for the longer spans and too small for the shorter spans. A shallow depth in the longer spans can also lead to problematic deflections. Girder spacing is also a very important parameter in designing an economical steel girder bridge. Generally, the fewest girders result in the most economical design. Fewer girders result in reduced fabrication, inspection, painting, shipping, and erection time. Fewer bearings are also required, and entire cross frame lines can be eliminated. However, there are associated trade offs. Frequently, the girder depth cannot be increased due to the clearance envelope requirements. Flange sizes are limited to practical plate sizes or live load deflection limits must be met. Staged redecking and phased construction considerations may also dictate how many girders are required, how many girders are required for the cross section. Wider girder spacing can also lead to somewhat thicker, heavier concrete decks. As a practical matter, the girders in the cross section and straight bridges are best all made the same. Otherwise, the exterior and interior girders are designed for different loads, leading to inefficient designs if all girders are kept the same size or to different size girders with differing stiffnesses. Thus, the optimal cross section is one having girder spacings and deck overhangs such that the exterior and interior girders have nearly the same total demand moments. <clears throat> this means that the loads applied to the exterior girders and the interior girders should be relatively the same. We will quickly look at how dead and live loads are distributed to the exterior girder so that we can then determine a rule of thumb for the overhang width so that the interior and exterior girders can be the same section. Non-composite dead loads applied to the steel section only, or what is called DC1 loads, consist primarily of the self-weight of the steel, the weight of any stay-in-place forms, and the weight of the wet concrete in the deck. These loads are typically assigned equally between all girders in the cross section if the girders are approximately equal stiffness at the cross frame connection points. This would be the case for the two framing plans shown on this slide when all girders are the same size. Intermediate cross frames act to equalize the girder deflections within a cross section and in the cases shown nearly equalize the load in equal stiffness non-composite girders regardless of the amount of load applied to the individual girders. Using this assumption in these cases, in lieu of the more traditional tributary area assumption applied to the weight of the wet concrete and the forms is particularly important in helping to determine more accurate non-composite deflections which are used in establishing girder cambers. To better simulate the actual distribution of the barrier loads, these are the barriers as we saw in lecture one, or what's called DC2 loads applied to the composite section after the concrete deck hardens, when line girder analysis are performed, consider assigning a percentage of the loads to the exterior girders and the first adjacent interior girder, which is a better assumptions based on an examination of refined analysis results for several cases. If the overhang is particularly large, the engineer may choose to use the live load distribution lever rule to determine the effect of the dead load on the exterior uh, girder from the deck. In some cases, the interior girders may actually sense an uplift condition for large overhang loads. For the wearing surface load, DW, an equal distribution of the load to all the girders is, reasonable, is a reasonable assumption and has been the customary practice. 
And we will look how these are distributed when we get to the example we're going to use for Simon. Live load distribution factors estimate the amount of the design vehicle load that is resisted by a single girder for the line girder analysis technique. There are empirical distribution factors for interior girders and methods for the exterior girders in the Ashtol specifications. But the specification also states that for multi eye girder bridges, the cross frames or diaphragms, with cross frames or diaphragms, the distribution factor for the exterior girder is not to be taken less than that which would be obtained assuming the cross section deflects and rotates as a rigid cross section. The equation at the bottom here is given in the astral commentary and satisfies this assumption. The equation is analogous to the conventional approximation used for computing loads on foundation pile groups. The special investigation is specified because the distribution factor empirical equations and methods given in the specification were determined without consideration of cross frames or diaphragms. Hence, while they are conservative for interior girders, they are generally unconservative for exterior girders in multi-girder steel bridges. Therefore, the distribution factor for the exterior girders determined from this special analysis will usually control and should be employed. These requirements for the exterior girder are why live load distribution factors is one of the tricky parts for steel bridge design. As a result of using these more accurate assumptions for the distribution of dead and live load to the individual girders in the cross section, the exterior girders will typically be assigned more total factored moment than the interior girders. In general, if the def deck overhang is too large, the exterior girders will be critical and will be required to be larger than the interior girders, which leads to, an econ to ec uneconomical designs. Thus, keeping a reasonably small overhang with a minimal number of girders yields the most economical steel eye girder cross section in most cases. Experience shows that deck overhangs for cast in place concrete decks limited to between approximately 28 and 35% of the girder spacing, tend to yield a reasonable balance between the total interior and exterior girder moments. Moving on, we will discuss eye girder web proportioning. The proper web depth is an important consideration affecting not only the economy, but also the constructability and performance of steel girder bridges. Deeper girders not only lead to a stiffer bridge, but result in flanges that meet specified width to thickness limits and girders that are easier to handle. The chosen web depth also dictates these flange sizes. Flange sizes. In the absence of restrictions on proper span ratios or constraints due to clearance restrictions, it is usually desirable to use the near optimal depth for the largest span in the unit. The optimal depth is the depth that provides the minimum cost girder for a particular bridge. The optimum depth is a function of many factors and is elusive for composite steel girders because they are designed for two load conditions. That is, loads applied before and after the deck hardens. Fortunately, the efficiency of girders does not vary greatly when near the optimum. The iterative design option in Simon can be used to help establish an optimum depth by allowing the engineer to quickly develop a series of designs at different web depths to arrive at an optimum depth based on the user input weight and or cost factors that were described previously. The suggested minimum depths given in the LRFD specification, which are based on traditional span to depth ratios, should be met or exceeded where practical. Shown in the top table are the suggested minimum depths related to the overall depth of the composite girder. The suggested minimum depth shown for simple spans is equivalent to a traditional span to depth ratio of 25. For continuous spans, the requirement for simple spans is multiplied by 
a factor of 0.8 to account for the assumed double end continuity due to the multiple spans. The suggested depths given in the bottom table are for steel, on, steel girder only or non-composite bridges. For simple spans, the suggested minimum depth is equivalent to a, the traditional span to depth ratio of 30. For continuous spans, the requirement for simple spans is again multiplied by the factor of 0.8. Note that the engineer is permitted to use a depth that is shallower than these suggested minimums and in some cases is forced to do so by other constraints. However, when depths below these suggested minimums must be used, additional attention should be paid to the structure deformations and cross-frame forces. An important thing to keep in mind is that the optimum depth of the girder will typically be significantly above the suggested minimum depths. Therefore, one possible approach to consider is to apply the recommended minimum depth for the overall depth of the composite girder shown in the top table to the depth of the steel section only or the non-composite. So instead of for a composite bridge using 0.04L, raise it up to 0.033L. The resulting web depth could then be used as a starting point in Simon with the depth varied in increments above and below the starting depth using the iterative design option to arrive at the optimum depth. Once a web depth is selected, the limiting web slenderness ratio given in LRFD specification, as shown here, can be used to establish a minimum web thickness. As a practical matter, the AASHTO NSBA Steel Bridge Collaboration Guide G12.1 states that fabricators prefer a minimum web thickness of one half inch to reduce the deformation of the web during fabrication and potential weld distortions. Typical steel girder bridges do not have longitudinal stiffeners as it is usually less expensive to specify a slightly thicker web than to fabricate and weld on longitudinal stiffeners. Longitudinally stiffened webs are usually only for very long span bridges with very deep girders. A big issue with regard to choosing a web thickness is to decide whether to go with an unstiffened web or a transversely stiffened web. Web panels with transfer stiffeners spaced at distances larger than the limits shown here are considered to be unstiffened webs. Note that the cross-frame connection plates should always be considered to act as transfer stiffeners. Unstiffened panels resist less shear than stiffened panels. A helpful guideline is that approximately 10 pounds of web material should be saved for every one pound of stiffener material added if you are going to stiffen the web. The best solution often is to select a web thickness that provides a so-called partially stiffened web in which only a few stiff transfer stiffeners are needed adjacent to each support where the shear is high and away from those supports, the unstiffened web is adequate to resist that shear. And we will see this in the example. Let's move on to discuss the eye girder flange proportioning. Sizing of flange is one of, is one of the most important issues in obtaining economical steel girder bridge designs. The basic cross-section proportion limits for flanges of eye steel eye girders given in the specification are shown here. The limits apply to both tension and compression flanges. A minimum flange width of 12 inches is always suggested to prevent flange distortion and cupping due, due to welding. As a practical matter, the collaboration guide states that fabricators prefer a minimum flange thickness of 3 quarters of an inch. For multi-span plate girder bridges, the flanges are often changed between the positive moment region and the negative moment region with a field splice between two shipped sections. At a field splice, the flange can change both width and thickness. In terms of establishing the location of flange transitions or welded shop splices within a section, 
there are several well-established guidelines to keep in mind. The maximum length of flange plate is optimally about 80 feet, or sometimes even less. But longer plates are certainly available also. The designer is urged to consult industry plate availability guides. Flange width is best held constant within a field section and only changed at a field splice, assuming that the fabricator will slab weld the flanges and flange widths are best changed only at the field splices. A reasonable way to control stress concentrations <coughs> at welded shop splices is to ensure that the thickness of the smaller flange plate at the splice is not less than one half the thickness of the larger plate. This guideline can often <coughs> be used to establish locations to introduce a welded shop splice in the flange. That is, at locations where a smaller plate, one half the thickness of the larger plate at the splice can be best used. The top, <coughs> excuse me, top and bottom flanges in plate girders may differ and usually do. When initially laying out a framing plan for a bridge, one has to start somewhere. This table shows some suggested cross-frame spacings to, consi to consider for preliminary investigations for simple spans and for different regions of girders and continuous spans. Obviously, upon further detailed investigation of the flange resistance requirements for the chosen spacings, adjustments to these initial spacings may need to be made, which Simon allows the user to investigate. It is recommended that the chosen spacing not deviate too much beyond the traditional maximum cross-frame spacing limit of 25 feet, and that, had, that has existed in previous Astral specifications. The cross-frame sp spacing is important for the constructability checks when the steel girders are not laterally supported while the concrete deck is placed. This slide summarizes in general terms the trade-offs that occur when utilizing a closer versus a larger cross-frame spacing. Investigation is usually required to determine the most economical choice for a given bridge layout. Lower cross-frame costs are obtained with a larger cross-frame spacing, only if the connection costs are not too high. Relatively, the narrower the flanges, the closer the cross-frame spacing must be due to the constructability requirements. However, cross-frames are more costly than flange steel, so wider flanges are usually desirable over additional cross-frames. By varying the spacing or increasing cross-frame spacing in some regions where excess capacity exists, while reducing the spacing in other regions where additional capacity is needed, economy in flange material can usually be gained. And finally, we'll talk about a little bit about shipping these field sections. Field sections are girder sections fabricated and shipped to the bridge site where they are joined together, usually by bolted field splices. The choice of field section weights and lengths is in many ways job specific where the weight and length of field sections can be limited due to shipping, the crane capacity in the fabrication shop, and the size of the fabricator's lay down areas or blasting machines. For shipping, we can ship sections that are heavier and longer than legal loads, but that usually requires permits and escorts. It may be more economical to use smaller sections to reduce or eliminate the extra shipping costs. Shown on this slide are some useful length, weight, height, and width recommendations for I-section I -section shipped pieces for truck shipment which truck shipment is currently the most common mode of shipment. We will finish this part of the lecture before we get into the example by looking at the initial design and overview of Simon for a three-span continuous plate girder bridge for a 455-foot long bridge. 
The specific eye girder example we are going to use is design example one taken from the NSBA Steel Bridge Design Handbook. This design example is delivered as part of the Steel Bridge Suite and can be referred to for additional details regarding the specific design checks that are made by Simon. For this example, we will input a starting design and any necessary design parameters into, into Simon and use the LRFD analysis option to run the program for only one design cycle so we can evaluate the results. Like for eSpan 140 design software, the best way to learn the program is to use it. So again, we will step through the Simon, but we will not pay too much attention to the specific details. But first, before we get to Simon, we must develop an initial trial design according to the requirements and the suggestions we just covered. Using the guidelines that we discussed earlier, we arrived at an optimal span layout of 175 feet for the interior span, with the end spans being 140 feet each, or 8 tenths of the interior span length, in order to achieve a balanced span arrangement. For the end spans, preliminary five cross frame spacings of 24 feet in the span with a 20 foot spacing adjacent to the interior pier have been chosen. For the center span, preliminary spacings of 27 feet in the span with 20 feet spacing adjacent to each interior pier will be used. Our chosen five field section lengths are 100 feet in the end spans, 91 feet in the center span, and 82, uh, an 82 foot section over each pier. Since it is assumed that the bridge can be closed for future redecking and the traffic rerouted, we are going to go with four girders in the cross section at a nice wide spacing of 12 feet. For this spacing, a nine and a half inch thick cast in place concrete deck will be used where a half inch of that is a sacrificial wearing surface, leaving us a structural deck thickness of nine inches. Concrete barriers are assumed to weigh 520 pounds per foot each. Deck haunches over each girder are three and a half inches thick, measured from the top of the girder web to the bottom of the concrete deck. A future wearing surface of 25 pounds per square foot is assumed. The deck overhang hangs are each set at three and a half feet, which gives a ratio of deck overhang to girder spacing of 0.29. This is in between our suggested values of 0.28 and 0.35. The out-to-out -out width of the deck is 43 feet, providing 40-foot roadway that can accommodate up to three 12-foot wide design traffic lanes. Here is the initial layout of the girder section. It shows the first span and the middle span out, of, out to the center line of the bridge. For span one, there is a bolted field splice at 100 foot between the two field sections. The web selected is a 69 inch by half inch in the positive moment regions and a 9 16th inch thick for over the interior support after the field splice. The web depth to interior span ratio of 0.03 is 0.033, which meets the recommended minimum. It also meets the uh, web depth over thickness ratio limit of 150 for no longitudinal stiffeners. For the first field section, there is a welded shop splice at 42 feet, where the bottom flange transitions from an 18 by 7 8 inch to an 18 by 1 and 3 8 inch for the positive moment region. The top flange stays a 16 inch by 1 inch for this entire first field section. After the bolted field splice, the flange is changed to a 20 by 1 inch on the bottom and an 18 by 1 inch top flange until the shop splice in the second field section where the bottom becomes a 20 inch by 2 inch and the top becomes an 18 by 2 inch for the negative moment region. These flanges all meet the AASHTO and recommended flange requirements. The middle span shown here also meet all of these requirements and these recommendations. 
The connection plates at the cross frames are also designed to be transfer stiffeners. There are also additional transfer stiffeners near the supports for the, for the shear design. The first stiffener from the left support is at 87 inches. When divided by the web depth, the ratio is less than 1.5 for an end panel, so the web panel is considered stiffened. Towards the middle of this first span, only the cross frame stiffeners are present at 24 foot spacings. Dividing this 24 feet by the web depth gives a ratio well over four, and any panel ratio above three is considered an unstiffened web. So this design would be defined as a partially stiffened web, where we have stiffened panels near the high shear areas at the ends of the girder, at the ends of the span, and unstiffened in the middle. So knowing all that, now we will enter the trial design into Simon. When Simon is first executed, a blank form appears. Using the file menu option at the top of the form, the user chooses to enter to either define a new model or open an existing model. The general properties form shown here then appears. Three comment lines are allowed at the top of the form to identify the project. The bridge layout is then identified. The beam type is either an eye girder or a box girder. We have chosen the eye girder for this case. The number of spans, the number of girders, and the number of 12 foot wide design traffic lanes are then input. The run type we have selected is the LRFD analysis option, which means the program will run for one design cycle to evaluate a particular design that has been input. The other run type that can be selected is the LRFD design option, in which case the program will take the starting design the user has input and automatically run through several analysis, evaluation, redesign cycles, making incremental changes to the girder design as necessary in order to achieve convergence. The user has some control over this design process by de de defining redesign and maximum performance ratios. Values of 0.9 and 1 are chosen here. A performance ratio is the ratio of a calculated value to the permissible value for a given design criteria. A ratio greater than the user input maximum performance ratio indicates that the current design is invalid and redesign is mandatory. That is, the flanges must be made larger and or the web must be made thicker. Note that when the LRFD analysis run type is chosen, these four user input, input parameters are ignored since all it's doing is analyzing the input design. The final parameters to be entered by the user on this form are some deck properties and the average daily truck traffic in a single lane used for fatigue investigations. The next LRFD Simon input form will ask for input of the live load distribution factors. As discussed earlier, for live load moment, the exterior girder will typically control. Simon needs moment and shear distribution factors for multiple and single lane loading. These distribution factors come from the Astro LRFD design specifications as we discussed previously. The third input form on the list deals with input parameters related to material properties. Specifically, the user must input the modular ratio for the concrete strength, the slab concrete com compression strength, the, reinforcing, the slab reinforcement yield strength, and the stiffener yield strengths. The concrete type, that is normal weight, sand, lightweight, or all lightweight, steel surface condition, that is weathering or painted steel, and connection plate type, that is welded or bolted, must also be selected for the fatigue checks. <clears throat> the next input item on the list is going to be load information, specifically the magnitudes of the composite dead loads that are to be applied to the girder, and the live loads that will be applied in the analysis. The composite dead loads include the components DC2 loads, which consists solely of the barriers, in this particular case, and the wearing surface, DW. 
These loads are applied to the long-term composite section in the analysis and when determining stresses that account for the effects of concrete creep. In this case, it is assumed that each barrier load of 520 pounds per foot is distributed equally to the exterior girder and the first adjacent interior girder, resulting in an applied load of 260 pounds per foot to each of these girders. The future wearing surface load of 25 pounds per square foot is multiplied by the roadway width of 40 feet and distributed equally to each of the four girders, which is a reasonable assumption. The resulting load on each girder is 250 pounds per foot. The computed uniform composite dead loads are input on the loads input form. Note that a space is also provided on the form for the input of utility loads applied to the composite section if they are present on the bridge. Live load information is also provided on this form. The user can select either an analysis which develops an envelope of the live load effects caused by the standard H ASHTO HL93 design live load and a special user-defined design vehicle, or an analysis for the special user-defined design vehicle only. If the first option is selected, which is the case here, and there is no special design vehicle defined by the user, which is also the case here, live load effects will be due to the standard HL93 design live load only. Special user-defined ve design vehicles, such as design permit loads, can have up to 20 axles with variable axle spacings and are defined on a subsequent input form that pops up if that uh, option is selected. We see that a uniform live load can also be included. Other live load parameters which are input on this form include the factor used to check live load deflection, which defaults to 800 as in the live load deflection is limited to the span length divided by 800. A pedestrian live load for the sidewalks and the dynamic load allowance factor applied to the design truck for strength design requirements and fatigue. According to ASHTO LRFD specifications, the load components for the HL93 vehicular live load include several load cases that are applied to determine the maximum demand. These include an HL, HL93 truck with a lane load and a heavy tandem pair with the lane load. For negative moments over the piers, portions of the vehicles are placed on both adjacent spans. Simon automatically considers all of these load cases for the HL93 loading. The dynamic load allowance is a static increase of load from the dynamic response of the bridges when vehicles pass. For instance, the moment from the HL93 loading is increased 33% for the strength design limit and 15% for the fatigue design checks. The lane loads from these load cases and dynamic load allowance are distributed to the girder by the live load distribution factors. In other words, the distribution factor estimates how much of a lane load that a single girder must resist considering multiple vehicles in multiple lanes across the bridge. The next LRFD Simon input form is in sequence involves a couple of items related to transfer stiffener design. The required spacing and design of the transfer stiffeners is performed in LRFD analysis mode if the input design meets design requirements and in LRFD design mode after a successful convergence of the design iterations is completed. The first input item is the maximum permitted transfer spacing in units of inches. The LRFD specification permits stiffener spacings up to three times the web depth in stiffened panels without longitudinal stiffeners, and in spacings up to 1.5 times the web depth in stiffened panels with longitudinal stiffeners. The second item on this form is used to indicate whether or not the transfer stiffeners are on one side of the web or both sides of the web, which is necessary information for the design of the stiffeners themselves. Here our, our maximum spacing is three times the web depth if the shear panel is to be defined as stiffened. 
The next input form and sequence involves several items related to shear stud design. Transfer stiffener design and shear connector design is performed in LRFD analysis mode if the input design meets requirements and in LRFD design mode after a successful convergence of the design iterations is completed. Also, the user must request on this form that a shear connector design be performed. Since the shear connector design has no effect on the girder design, an efficient procedure is to request a shear connector design only after the girder design is finalized. Shear connectors are designed to satisfy fatigue requirements and are checked for the ultimate strength limits. The next form involves the input of span information. Included in the input information requested on this form is the uniform component dead load or DC1 load acting on the non-composite section in the span under consideration. As discussed previously, for an orthogonal framing plan like the one chosen for the example bridge, it is best to distribute the DC1 loads equally to each girder. In this case, the DC1 loads include the weight of the concrete deck, including that sacrificial wearing surface, the weight of the tapers in the, con in the deck overhangs, the weight of the deck haunches, and stay-in-place forms which are assumed to weigh 15 pounds per square foot and an assumed weight for the cross frames and details. Note that these weights are computed for the total bridge width and are then divided equally to the four girders in the cross section, resulting in a uniform load on each girder of 1,508 pounds per foot. However, the weight of the girder flanges and webs, which is also a DC1 load, is automatically included in LRFD Simon so the girder self-weight should not be included in this uh, input of uniform load. Shown here is the span information form for span one. The span length of 140 feet and the non-composite uniform dead load for the span of 1508 pounds per foot are entered. Also entered on this form is the bottom flange cross frame spacing adjacent to the interior piers in the span. This is used to check the lateral torsional buckling of the eye girder discreetly braced bottom compression flange adjacent to the pier. For the example bridge, the spacing is 20 feet in span one. Since we have indicated on the form that the top flange is not fully braced for non-composite loads, we need to enter a cross frame spacing for the top flange in the positive moment region of the span, which in this case is 24 feet in span one. This spacing is used to check for lateral torsional buckling of the discreetly braced top compression flange in the positive moment region under the DC1 loads. We have further indicated that the top flange is continuously braced in the final condition so that a buckling check will not be made at the strength limit state. Similar information is entered on the span information for span two. In this case, the span length is entered as 175 feet and the non-composite top flange cross brace cross frame spacing in the positive moment region of span two is entered as 27 feet. Since the structure is symmetrical about the bridge center line and span three is identical to span one, Simon allows us to take advantage of this fact to reduce the amount of input. By simply indicating that span three is, is a symmetrical span, on the span information form for that span as shown here, no further input is required for span three. Now let's start with the input of the girder cross section, which we will demonstrate for span one only. For span one, we enter the, up here we find one, two, three, four, five different tabs we have to fill in to define the, um, characteristics of the girder in span one. We enter the section properties for the web, top flange, bottom flange, slab, and field splice. The different end locations, for instance, uh, the different end locations, for instance, at transfer stiffener locations and shop and field splice locations, specified on these forms are where Simon will produce the design checks. 
It takes a little practice to get everything right entering a girder into Simon. We will only briefly show the process here. First, the web properties are input. The web is 69 by a half inch for the first 100 feet, then changes to a 69 by 9 16 after the bolted field slice. That is shown right here. Here's the 69 by one half all the way out to 100 feet. And then from there to 140 feet, it goes to 9 16 Then for the top flange, the top flange is 16 by one for the first 100 feet, then changes to an 18 by one at the bolted field splice, and again changes to an 18 by two at the 140 foot shop splice to the interior pier. So for the first 100 feet, it's an 18 by, uh, a 16 by one, from there to the uh, from there to the shop or shop splice in the field section, it's an 18 by one, and then it changes to an 18 by two. The bottom flange starts as an 18 by seven eighths for the first 42 feet, where it changes to an 18 by one and three eighths at the shop splice. It continues with that until the bolted field splice at 100 feet. At the field splice, it changes to a 20 by one for the next 25 feet, and then changes to a 20 by two at the shop splice for over the interior pier. Under the slab tab or the, yeah, the slab tab, the effective width is entered as 101 half inches, and that comes from the standard or from the astral specifications, along with a nine inch structural slab thickness. Yes, the deck is actually nine and a half, and we use that for the dead load, but we are assuming that a half inch of that is going to wear off or not be effective. And for the structural calculations, we only use a nine inch structural slab. And also here is the area of the reinforcing steel in the deck. And finally, the field splice location is entered at 100 feet from the left end. We would repeat this process for span two. And then again, we would just say for span three, it is symmetrical to span one. So after inputting all of that, we put in the span arrangements, the girders, the girder space, or no, we didn't put in girder spacing, the, the number of girders, the number of land, all of that stuff. Simon now is ready to analyze the bridge and execute the design checks. But first, to help control the amount of output generated by LRFD Simon, the user can input some result controls. Entering a minus one in this box will print the results for the last design cycle only. If a positive number is entered in this box, this will indicate the cycle frequency of the generated output. If the box is left blank, Output will be generated for the first and the last design cycles only. In the second box, the user can indicate the performance ratio above which any messages are output. In this case, we have chosen 0.3. So for any design check in the astral specifications, if the performance ratio, meaning demand over capacity, exceeds 0.3, it's going to explain it to us. The last box indicates whether or not certain details that may be of interest are included in the output. Here, we skip the material and fabrication cost menu items. These are fa factors and costs you can input to compare the economy of different designs as discussed earlier in this lecture. It is a useful tool for optimizing designs, but we will not look at them here for this analysis. Once the input of all the data is completed, the user clicks on the analyze menu at the top of the screen and clicks on run analysis to execute LRFD Simon. The results are shown under the results menu. Now we will briefly examine some of the Simon results for our three span example I girder bridge. Here we see an excerpt from the output at the maximum positive moments section in span one showing the calculated section properties along with a summary list of the specific design checks that were made at this section by Simon that exceeded that threshold of 0.3. Listed for each check are the related Ashville specification article number and version of the spec, 
the performance ratio for that spec, and a short description of what that design check is. Since all the performance ratios are less than one, Simon is stating that the girder meets the Ashtel design requirements at this location. However, there are a couple caveats that the engineer must consider. Note that the performance ratio for the top flange lateral torsional, torsional buckling check for constructability at this section is 0 0.519, which is the maximum ratio listed for the constructability checks. The maximum ratio for these checks is in the top flange should be conservatively limited to a value between approximately 0.5 and 0.6, since deck casting analysis results in lateral flange bending stresses due to overhang bracket effects are not considered, not currently considered in Simon, it is a shortfall of the program. So the engineer has to be smart enough to realize that that value should be limited to about 0.6. Also, at the bottom, the maximum performance ratio at this section overall is 0.969. By the category C prime fatigue check for a bottom flange cross frame connection plate weld to the flange. That sounds pretty impressive. However, if we look at the girder elevation view, that'll show us that there is not a cross frame, cross frame at this location. Hence, there is no category C prime fatigue detail here, and this ratio may be ignored. So yet, yeah, the engineer still has to have the smarts to be able to read these outputs. So from these two caveats, the engineer still needs to consider that the, re the results in context to the bridge characteristics and the Ashtell design requirements. Having taken care of these two little caveats, the maximum performance ratio is 0.773 by the service to design requirement at the bottom flange. This is slightly larger than the strength one performance ratio of 0.739 just below it. And this is typical in positive moment regions of straight composite steel bridges when the positive moment section is considered to be compact. So the final, the final result is that the positive moment region in span one has a maximum performance ratio of 0.773 from the Ashto service to limit state. The input design works at this location. Of course, this is only the 0.4L location. This is just the positive moment region in the first span. And the engineer must also make sure that the bridge design is acceptable along the entire length. But let's check this equa the equation for this critical service to limit state performance ratio 0.773. This is a stress limit and we will need the elastic section properties to calculate stresses. And I've highlighted those up here in the red. Here we see the unfactored nominal dead and live load moments at the maximum positive section in span one, as determined by the LRFD Simon. This, the section is located 57.9 feet or approximately 40% of the span length from the abutment. At this 40% point in the span, we have a non-composite dead load moment that causes stresses on the steel only section modulus, SX1. That's this first line. The composite dead load and wearing surface dead load moments that cause stresses along cause stresses on the long-term composite section, S3N, and that's the section line, second line. And the live load moments that cause stresses on the short-term composite section, SN, and that's this line. So here are the moment, the nominal moments at that section, and here are the bottom flange section moduli for the 
different constructed pieces when those loads are applied. Now, without getting too deep into the design standards, the critical service to limit state requirement is that the stresses produced by the factored moments on their respective section moduli must not exceed 95% of the yield stress. The dead and wearing surface moments have a factor of one. Oops, a factor of one. And the live load moment or the truck loading moment is increased 30% as the factor. The following equation right here shows how those factored stresses are calculated by taking now 2181, which is the non composite dead load, is in foot pounds, so we have to cha change it into, I'm sorry, foot kips, which we have to change it into inch kips to divide by the section modulus for the steel only section, which is in inches cubed, comes out to these are the stresses applied due to the non-composite dead loads. We can add the DC2 and the wearing surface moments together because they are both on the section, the long-term composite section of 2487. And those are the stresses contributed by the composite moments. And then the live load has a factor of 1.3, a moment of 3521, change it into inches, and its short-term section modulus is 2704. And those are the stresses uh, contributed by the factored live load for a total of 36.72 KSI. The design limit of 95% of the yield stress is 47.5 KSI, so the girder meets the service to criterion with a performance ratio, meaning the applied versus the available of 0.773, the same that Simon calculated. However, this is a look at only the 0.4L location in only span one. Simon will check the design requirements along the entire length of the bridge. The results allow the engineer to modify and adjust the design or let Simon redesign proportions of the girder for a practical and economical steel girder design. So this was an example of what Simon can do for the design engineer. Simon is a powerful tool for the engineer that knows how to use it. It can be used to quickly investigate a number of design alternatives and options to potentially, uh, potentially arrive at a more cost-effective design. For instance, would an unstiffened web potentially be more cost effective? Take out all the stiffeners. How about how do changes to the cross frame spacing influence the design? Or even if, if flange welded shop splices are placed in the optimal locations. So in summary, Simon handles all of the design calculations in a fast, orderly, and thorough manner essentially freeing up the engineer to more quickly investigate various design alternatives in order to arrive at a more cost-effective steel girder design. The important thing to keep in mind is that the engineer is still in charge of all the design choices and must select suitable starting designs in order to use Simon most effectively. This example has attempted to provide some useful guidelines based on experience and good industry practice in order to allow the engineer to arrive at more suitable starting eye girder designs for straight girder bridges with limited SKUs for input into the design software. Here is the contact information on how to get Simon from the National Steel Bridge Alliance. That concludes lecture three. In lecture three, we looked at how to get a good initial design for continuous span steel bridges considering span, girder depth, and girder spacing layouts, and the analysis and optimum design software package Simon from the National Steel Bridge Alliance. In lecture four, we will go into more detail on practical and economical detailing and fabrication processes for steel bridges. We will also look at corrosion protection systems such as weathering steel, stainless steel, galvanizing, metallizing, and painting. Lecture four will also show the process of fabricating a steel bridge in the shop.